Hello and welcome to Hour of History. I'm your host, Stephen Bauman, and this week we have Ben Gafel on the show. Ben is a teacher in Asuncion, Paraguay. He is from New York State. He's taught in New York City, in South Korea, and he's traveled all over the world. This is a fascinating episode. You're going to want to stick around if you're interested in education, traveling, or just a good story. This episode is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook down Download and 30 day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash hour of history. Be sure to stick around to the end of the episode for some excellent suggestions for your first free book at Audible. Over 180,000 titles are there if you don't like our suggestions, and you can choose from them and put them right on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. That is at www.audibletrial.com forward slash hour of history. That way you can learn with your audiobook after listening to your excellent podcast in which you are fascinated. So thanks again for joining. Please remember to subscribe and please check out hourofhistory.com forward slash R-E-C-S, Rex, hourofhistory.com forward slash Rex to check out all these great suggestions of books and other things that we've made on each episode. Thanks again for listening. On Hour of History, it's our world, anytime, any place. Enjoy. This is the Hour of History podcast. Our world, anytime, any place. And now from the Hour of History studio in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, your Hour of History starts right now. Hello and welcome to Hour of History. I'm your host, Stephen Bauman, and talking with me is Ben Gaffel. Ben has taught all over the world, and I'm so excited that he's on Hour of History to share his experiences, uh, both teaching abroad, teaching in the United States, being a teacher, being a student, being interested in the world. I think we will all have a lot to learn from him. So welcome, Ben. How's it going? Hey, man. Uh, it's going really well. It's nice to talk to you again. Yes, it is so good to hear your voice. We, uh, Ben and I, got our, got our experience out there on 103rd Street. <laughs> Indeed, we did. Yeah, at uh, West Prep High, or <laughs> middle school, rather. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was wild times out there. And where are you now, Ben? Uh, right now, I am teaching at the American School of Asuncion in Paraguay. All right. So is it is it true that the, the toilets spin in the opposite direction on uh, the southern hemisphere? <laughs> you know, that thought occurred to me uh, more than once, but I'm yet to verify. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe now you have something to do after the podcast because, you know, teachers aren't that busy. Um, no, yeah, I have, nothing, I have nothing to do. <laughs> so why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into teaching or traveling your choice oh um well i mean traveling i guess um from all my life we always you know through elementary school middle school high school um we took uh summer vacations and you know to various parts of the united states i remember in particular, one trip when I was, man, I don't know, maybe about 12, uh, we took our old uh, caravan or something like that, some minivan, and, and we packed it up and drove across the United States and took the whole month of July. And uh, yeah, and that was, you know, a pretty transformative experience as a young kid. Um, so, you know, credit to my parents for, you know, instilling that that kind of bug and curiosity. Uh, and so that continued. And uh, in terms of teaching, mm -hmm. I've always kind of been in that, um, in that realm, so to speak. Um, you know, working in after school programs or mentor programs or as teaching aides, like in high school or tutoring in college. And I realized, you know, that I didn't want a job where I couldn't interact with people. So, uh, you know, there's almost no career uh, more personal than being a teacher. You interact with, you know, hundreds of people every day. 
what a neat opportunity that is to travel at a young age. And, and certainly that does expose you to different kind of people. And uh, then you might yeah, want to sh- share that love and teaching. Um, did you study education as an undergrad? As an undergrad, uh, I took a couple of courses. Um, I double majored in English and Spanish and then was um, thinking about also um, maybe minoring or getting a credential in teaching. Uh, but, you know, within the time frame that I had, that wasn't feasible. So <clears throat> I took a couple of courses, but uh, nothing really resulted from it during my undergrad. Now, it wasn't until uh, afterwards at the New York City Teaching Collaborative that I was able to enroll in a master's program and get my actual degree. But that wasn't the first time that you taught. Uh, no. So the first time that I taught was uh, ESL in Chungju, South Korea, and that was right after my undergraduate in college. And was that uh, through like a college-affiliated program or was that a job you applied for? Yeah, no, it, it was interesting. You know, I uh, was a recent college graduate, you know, uh, May of 2011, and I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, and I had heard that people, you know, go and do this. And so I kind of found this random recruiting company online and the requirements were you need a four-year degree, you need to be a native English speaker, and then you can apply. So I did. Um, <laughs> and what was your Korea experience? Um, was this just because you, you had Spanish and English? <clears throat> right. Yeah. So um, it kind of took me away from the Spanish a little bit. Um, ultimately, my goal from middle school was to get to Central America in some degree. Uh, And so I knew that I wanted to do that. But, you know, as many of us know, when you graduate undergrad, you've got a boatload of student loans to deal with. Um, So I couldn't just move to Central America and volunteer and have no income. So I had to make sure I saved enough. And that was one of the reasons that I went to South Korea, because I knew that that was possible. And uh, so, um, yeah. So that's yeah. It wasn't no. It wasn't. It wasn't a college uh, endorsed thing. Um, you know, I kind of just went uh, and the Korea experience. You know, well, it depends on which aspect because there's a lot to it. <laughs> I think people would be interested to hear because I, I know uh, th- there's still opportunities for people to go to Korea and China. I was just a student in Korea and then I taught in China, but. Uh, this is something that a lot of undergraduates think about, certainly, and, and j- even people who are looking for a career change. So what was Korea yeah. like for someone who had uh, never been there, or no experience with Korea? Um, I, you know, the, the stories, uh, there's a whole spectrum of stories, you know. Um, I remember arriving and hearing stories of people who, you know, flew from North America, took the you know, whatever, 14 hour flight, arrived in the airport in Incheon, got cold feet and turned around and (laughs) bought a ticket back. (laughs) So those, those kinds of stories exist. Um, And then there are stories of, you know, people who work there and typically what people do, unless you're in a, you know, um, within the public education system in South Korea, which is a little bit less common, um, Typically, what people do is they are employed in what are called hagwans or, you know, academies, after school academies where parents pay for their students to go and have extra studies. And, um, you know, there are academies for music or art or language. And so I ended up at uh, an ESL academy and but they're run as a business model so they can go out of business. And, you know, there are stories of people who you know, arrive and a couple months later, their academy isn't doing so well and they just close their doors. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, um, expats are kind of stuck in those positions or you have an experience like mine, uh, which, and, and like many others, most others, I would say, which is, 
you know, you go and <clears throat> the hours are a little bit different. I think I worked from 2 PM till about 10 or 11 PM. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, you know, you meet other expats from around the world. I still have, uh, you know, a lot of some of my best friends from today I met there. Uh, and you know, the students are, like students anywhere, you know, that's a common theme, but like a lot of times eager to learn and you kind of get to do what you want because you're given a curriculum mm -hmm. and, you know, you're given your textbooks and, and whatever, but, and they have to fill out the textbooks. And so there's freedom in that you don't have to do any planning, so to speak. Uh, uh, yes. Right. So uh, <laughs> there's a lot, so there's a lot more free time to explore and, you know, get to know the cities and the countryside and things like that. Um, and, and that's uh, really cool lot. that you were outside of the city. I think a lot of people too, uh, either go with the expectation of wanting to be in Seoul or end up in Seoul one way or another. Uh, so I feel like you kind of saw a different part of Korea maybe than most. Oh, I certainly did. Um, you know, it's really a beautiful country. So I was in Chungju, which is uh, sort of central, country um and you know in the mountains it was a city of if i recall correctly about five hundred thousand people and when we would take the bus to seoul we would say you know oh we're, we live in chengdu and you know people would be like one of two things they would either say where's that or <laughs> or they would say oh you're out in the country like way out in the boonies five hundred thousand um, yeah small town yeah yeah very small um, but it, it, you know, it did have that, that, uh, essence though. Also, you know, it wasn't, you know, foreigners, although they were there, um, weren't as common a site as they would be in a city like Seoul. So it felt, um, it, you know, it felt real and it felt like, um, you know, I had an opportunity to see and experience things that other people wouldn't in Seoul, um, you know, the little mom and pop sort of places, uh, you know, the, I lived on the outskirts of the city and I shipped my bicycle. Thanks to my mom. She, I think she shelled out like $800 <laughs> or something, uh, to put it on the plane. Um, wow. it, it was something absurd like that. Um, and put it on the plane. And so I had my bicycle there and was able to leave the city and, you know, ride out into the mountains and into the rice paddies and places where taxis and buses would never get you or you would never know how to get there via taxi. So, you know, for the sake of exploration, being in a smaller city, smaller town uh, was excellent. That is so cool. Yeah, I think that's uh, part of the experience that a lot of people kind of uh, miss out on just being in the city or just being surrounded by foreigners. There's also the aspect of entering teaching at a hagwon. Um, <laughs> it's not exactly the ideal teaching circumstance, you know, no. the kids after they're tired, but uh, how, how did you like it? Did you just dive right in? Yeah. You know, I, again, you know, I was fresh out of college and, you know, I was going to dive into whatever it was that I was going to do. And, um, it, you know, I typically bring a lot of energy to the classroom anyways, and that was where I kind of honed that. And so, you know, I remember, you know, teaching third graders the word volcano and like, you know, stand, standing up on the chairs and making a big explosion and like jumping off the chairs and stuff. You know, if they're tired after school, that's going to get them riled up a little bit and it'll be fun nonetheless. So, yeah, that's you know. fantastic. Yeah. And then uh, so from, from there, you were there how long? I was there for a calendar year. Okay. All right. And, and while you were there, uh, this is one of the stresses of being a teacher and doing these abroad things is you've always got to be looking for the next step. Yeah. So how yeah. did you do it? Um, well, like I said, you know, I had uh, from about middle school, maybe it was ninth grade, uh, I had my sights set on Central America for whatever reason. I was just fascinated with it. I loved maps and, you know, in global history, I'd pull the map down during lunch, you know, those old 
maps that would roll up at the top of the chalkboard. <laughs> those are the best. Them. Yeah, those are great. And pull them down. And my buddy and I, we would, you know, just look at maps during lunch. And there was something about you know, that region of the world between North and South America, that small space that, you know, it, I don't know, I was curious. I had a lot of wonder about it. And so anyways, I wanted to get there. And so about six, seven months into my time, maybe it was eight, um, into my time in Korea, I knew that I had to start setting things up. So I was exploring, you know, what I can do in Central America. And I was looking for uh, you know, volunteering positions originally. And I came across a, like a database of positions and there was a posting for an operations manager at a hostel on the beach in Nicaragua. And I said, okay. Sounds uh, brutal. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to go for that. And, you know, so I sent out my cover letter and um, landed a Skype interview. So I Skype interviewed with, the owner of the hostel from South Korea (laughs) and ended up with a call back saying, okay, we want you to start in November. So, you know, I came back from Korea in September of 2012 and, you know, a month and a half later I was in Panama making my way up to Nicaragua for my next, for my next gig. Wow. That is quite a story. And, uh, your experience at the hostel, presumably that's a whole different kind of teaching where you're teaching adults how to behave and operate in a <laughs> foreign country. <laughs> uh, you know, it, was, it, it wasn't quite like that. Uh, because, you know, in some places it is. You've got your party hostels and it's just like, you know, I don't even want to be here because you're embarrassing. Um, but, yeah. you know, it, where, where we were... Um, it was, it was pretty off the beaten track. Um, you know, we were a tiny town called Hikilio, like seven kilometers from the nearest paved road about as far Northwest in the country as you could go. Um, you know, you climb the volcano called, uh, Cosiguina, you climb that and you're up on the ridge and you can look across the bay to El Salvador and, uh, Honduras. So, you know, we're, way, way up there. It's not like Managua or Granada or anything. And uh, so, you know, the, the folks who rolled through, you know, they, they knew what it was like and it wasn't, you know, your, your average bunch. And it was very mellow, no internet, uh, except for like this little USB stick that you like had to reserve, but you know, no, no Wi-Fi or anything like that. And that, so sounds, that sounds wonderful. Uh, it was, it was cleansing. <laughs> That's good. But eventually you had to return to real life and you chose a, uh, quite a, end, a return, huh? Yeah, indeed. Um, you know, I, after that, you know, every, you've reached points in your life where, um, you know, you've, you've reached a, a major milestone and, you know, like I said, that had been a goal for years, years and years and years. And finally I had done it. And then once it's over, you kind of ask yourself, okay, uh, now what? (laughs) And, um, so I, I came back to the States and, uh, kind of floundered for a little bit, a couple months. And I ended up, uh, working actually as, uh, an admissions intern, uh, at the, admissions office at CU Boulder. Um, and you now I was there for a couple months. And while I was there, I knew that I didn't, although Boulder, you know, if you've never been on the front range, of, like in Colorado, mm-hmm. it's amazing. It's beautiful, awesome place. But you know, it, the work that I was doing wasn't what I wanted to do. So I, you know, started branching out, exploring. Uh, and I thought, you know, I'm ready to actually build a career out of teaching. So I applied to, um, among others, the New York City Teaching Collaborative. And cool. Got it. Yeah. Got a call back and ended up there. So, yeah, I think uh, one of the important things about teaching and one of the things that makes really effective teachers is having these sort of experiences. Mm-hmm. They don't necessarily have to be all over the place, but just having experiences in which you meet other people and, you know, you kind of have, you interact with the real world. 
even uh, something like staring at the map when you're a student really comes back and you can tell which teachers have done this kind of thing and which teachers are just there for the gig, you know? Yeah, you know, and, and those kinds of teachers do exist, you know? Um, and mm -hmm. like a lot of people are afraid to say it, but you know, there are really bad teachers out there. Um, and, but one of the crucial things for sure is, you know, I think which extends from what you were talking about is recognizing that there are so many different kinds of people in every class that you have, you know, especially in a place, well, in a lot of places, but especially in a place like New York City, um, you know, where I ended up or any urban center where many teachers end up, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of diversity and you got to know that each of these students is an individual um, who has their own story. So yeah, let's, let's keep go with that for a little bit. So uh, as your time as a teacher in charge of a classroom in New York City, uh, how did you do that in this sort of industrial system where we have X number of students in the classroom and you have to produce them for a test or something, you know? Yeah, that's a good question, you know. Um, I, well, I got, I got very lucky, and I said this since, since day one. Um, I was hired by a team, more, more like a community, um, that ended up, I ended up being, being really close with them. Um, and, you know, most people who worked there, we were all friends, and, um, you know, and so having that, that mutual support was crucial, but in, I also got lucky in the sense that this was an alternative school. Um, so it was, it's called uh, a transfer school, which is basically uh, in simple terms, it's a school uh, in New York City, part of the New York City public school uh, system where students who previously hadn't had success uh, can elect to go to a transfer school to change environments, um, kind of, you know, get back on their, on the horse with earning their credits. Um, and, you know, students transfer there for many reasons. Maybe it's because they had dropped out um, because they were homeless or because they dropped out because, uh, you know, they were involved in gangs or maybe their school where they were was too violent and there was too much gang violence in their school and they wanted to get out because they wanted to study all different reasons, um, but in the end, my classes were much smaller than a typical classroom. You know, you hear stories about, you know, students standing and not having enough chairs, you know, 36, 38, 40 students in a room. Um, and I didn't have that experience, so. So how um, many yeah. students would be in a typical oh, class? Man. Well, you know, again, my, uh, old habits die hard. So, you know, I might have 18 students on my roster or 20 students on my roster. Uh, and I'd have, you know, between five and 10 show up. Um, well, that's yeah. almost like small group instruction at that point. Exactly. Um, which, you know, is disappointing in that you wish everybody were there, mm -hmm. but in that setting, you also realize the you know, the effectiveness and how much of a difference it can make to have a small community. Um, you know, when I'm working with seven, eight students, even 12, you know, um, it's so much easier. It's so much more personal. Uh, and I think it makes a big difference. Yeah. One of the things you said on your, on your website is uh, get to know their names. Mm. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I, uh, <laughs> um, I guess I'll start with New York. Um, so we at that school um, went on a first name basis, uh, which I was not expecting and is not typical. Um, some places might do it, but it's certainly not the norm from student up to administration. So, you know, students would call me by my first name, the assistant principal by her first name, the principal by his first name. And, uh, you know, it really, I feel, established a sense of individualism. Individualism, humanity, I recognize you as a person and who you actually are. Um, 
And, you know, you hear stories about uh, teachers who, um, you know, don't learn the names of their students for, you know, a week or two weeks or sometimes ever. Um, and it's, how can you expect uh, an individual who is meant to trust you, especially in that kind of environment who, you know, is skeptical of the, of the school system, the education system to begin with, you know, if you're not, if you don't know my name, what, then who are you to me, you know? Um, and so I remember I have a distinct memory of, <clears throat> You know, I, always on day one, I would rem remember their names. Uh, and I, you know, stand in front of the room and just practice and look silly. And, you know, while they're doing whatever, uh, you know, first day activity they're doing, I would just stand up there and rattle off names and do it again and do it again. And one student said, okay, now do it backwards. And, uh, <laughs> so, you know, which is good practice. It's not just pattern, you know, pattern memorizing. So, you know, and then yeah. I did it back to backwards and they were really impressed you know it can it can go a long way yeah yeah not only that but just the whole uh that you're willing to laugh at your that you can be wrong too the infallible teacher is is a human being as well yeah of course yeah you know it's funny um yeah you know, i'll just a short anecdote about the you know the name thing here in asuncion uh it, you know i don't know where it comes from because in new york the you know in the bronx and in a lot of places the tendency was to call teachers mister you know or miss mister yeah mr yeah, B. It, <laughs> yeah or not even not even a letter or anything. oh i got the letter i got respect oh, oh yeah wow <laughs> wow no yeah wow. i mean a lot i got mister a lot until you know i asked him enough times to call me ben um but <laughs> You know, I did the same thing here. And, you know, even here, they use, they just say Mr. And, really? uh, yeah. And so I, you know, as, as usual, day one, don't call me Mr. Please, like, use my name. Call me Ben if you want to be formal and call me Mr. Gefell or Mr. Ben or whatever, um, you know just use my name. And so now I've gotten into the habit of, you know, when they call me Mr., I just call them student. And, uh -huh. uh, and, and immediately they get it. They're like, oh yeah, Mr. Ben. Like, you know, cause there's something to be said about a name. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. A lot, a lot, like you said too, depends on the culture of the school and the sort of things right. that are, uh, you know, that are running with that. It's very interesting to see how these sort of things work out. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's an interesting comparison. And the small class sizes, like I'm still, I'm still focused on that. That seems to really mm -hmm. change a, a classroom dynamic. Yes? Yes, it does. And I've wow. heard teachers advocate for this kind of thing all over the place, but it seems to be one thing that just never really changes. That's true. Uh, it, hmm. You know, I don't know. I don't know when it will or if there's a, you know, if there are plans in place uh, to, to do so. But, you know, I, I strongly feel that if, you know, based on my experience in a small classroom and seeing the effect that it can have um, and also having witnessed overpacked classrooms, you know, something's, Something's got to change if major systemic uh, shifts are going to take place. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, let's just get back to your New York teaching for a second. Um, mm -hmm. You were at this transfer school for a while, and it sounds like you were in the ideal kind of situation to try out uh, pedagogy, try out things, uh, <laughs> teaching tactics. Yeah. Yeah, Can you yeah. give us a sample? What are some of the things that you did uh, that kind of like highlight your teaching philosophy or maybe tips that teachers can take away from this historically? Oh, that's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, one of my favorite projects uh, or one of my favorite, um, you know, instructional models, if you want to call it that, um, that I took here also is um, starting with the teaching of asking questions 
um, and focusing on questioning and what, you know, what, what is, what even is a good question and how do you ask them and when do you ask them and what does a good question sound like? What are the characteristics of a good question? Um, and, you know, and practicing that for a while and then allowing the students to ask their own questions uh, to form the basis of an open-ended project. So, um, you know, literally the project is student design from start to finish. Um, they, once we've practiced asking questions, they pose their question, they decide what relevant research, you know, they're going to do to help them I say explore an answer to that question because, you know, it may be a question uh, where, you know, we don't arrive at a particular answer and that's okay. You know, as long as, as long as we're seeking and we're looking and we're articulating our explorations and, uh, and then they can create any final product that they want. Um, and so that might, you know, it might look like something, standard many students choose to write essays or do powerpoints or whatever because that's what they're used to um, but other students um, you know like to do other things like i, I mean for example here um, i had one student just today actually um, uh, she wrote a script a choose your own adventure script for the <laughs> whole class for the whole class to participate in a mock trial of, of um, in which a couple of characters from No Country for Old Men were participating. And, uh, you know, it was just, I would never have come up with that ever. <laughs> and, you know, and here's this 10th grader, uh, you know, and this is her project. And it's, it's really yeah. inspiring um, to, to see the creative minds work. And, you know, one of my favorite questions uh, was this kid uh, back in New York. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of humorous, but, you know, it's a legitimate question. He was thinking about, maybe it was something from the news, and, it, and he was thinking about San Francisco, and his question <laughs> ended up being, why do people move to places where there are so many earthquakes? And, and what a great uh, question. Yeah, you know, like there are economic factors, there are, you know, weighing priorities of like the risk of a natural disaster versus, you know, there are, there's so much embedded in that question. And again, I would never have asked it. And it seems so superficial, it seems so simple, but there's so much opportunity to dive deep into it. And it's really amazing. Fantastic. So what a great system. I found a lot of the time, like even at the university level, you know, we have much more freedom teaching university courses. Let me be clear. I have, I can create a lot, but at the same time we have these uh, course descriptions and we do put ourselves into a syllabus, into a box, into something uh, linear progression. And uh it makes you think, you know, what if you just started the course with a question? If we didn't press ourselves with so much time and if instead we said, first, let's see what, what they want to learn about and it, it would really open things up. Um, it seems we're always on such a, a rush though. What, what is it you're teaching where you have freedom to uh, kind of explore? Is it, it the discipline is different? Is that why? A little more freedom in English? Yes, uh, that's a that's a major factor. Uh, is that you know I've found although you know if I were to put my mind to it, um, I'm sure that I could devise ways um, to you know step out of the box in whatever discipline. But you know to be fair, English is far easier uh, to be a little bit experimental. Um, yeah, that's why liberal because, arts are so important, right? Um, but also I wanted to ask you, do you ever, because I know there, there has to be the type out there, right? Do you get students ever get some animosity? Just say, just tell me what to do so I can be done with this class. <laughs> oh man, you, would, you wouldn't believe. Um, and, and that's an experience more here than I've had, uh, elsewhere. And, um, you know, I think, you know, it's called the American School of Asuncion and it's been uh, an American model for a long time, which, uh, you know, 
in a lot of ways, um, you know, mirrors, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Paulo Freire. Um, and so it Yeah, mirrors... but our, our, our readers might not be. So okay, you, yeah. a brief introduction. Yeah, yeah brief, brief introduction. Uh, so he's a Brazilian, uh, you know, thinker and has written about many topics, one of them being education. And so he, one of his uh, primary breakdowns of the education system is that there exists the banking system, which is basically, you know, the students know nothing, the teacher knows everything, and I'm going to drill it into your skull until you spit back at me what I want to hear. Um, and the other is what's called the problem posing uh, model, which, uh, you know, in fact, is about answering questions and the teacher and the students uh, tackling questions together and finding answers uh, or exploring answers to questions to which neither of them really have a definitive, uh, you know, a, a definitive idea of, of what the answer is. Anyway, so it, the model that exists here uh, is largely uh, banking um, and has been in the United States for a long time. And we took that um, here to, uh, or elsewhere in the world, wherever there are American schools, um, that model is prevalent. And, um, you know, and it's, and it's here where I get most of the pushback when I allow freedom of thought and freedom of expression and creativity and want them to think for themselves. Um, you know, many of my students, yeah, many of my students say, no, well, but tell me, you know, tell me how to do this and tell me like even down to can I write in blue or yes. can, I, can I title, can this be my title? And, or is it okay if it's, you know, three paragraphs instead of, you know, four and, you know, all of which are, you know, yeah, it, 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 it's certainly, it's, it's something I've noticed as well, but what's, and it's interesting too, I've noticed it um, in grade level change too. So like where younger students are less likely to ask you those questions. It's like at the younger grades, they start getting it, you know, beat into them. This is what you're going to do and everyone's going to do it in this format. And then by the time, you know, you're in college, it's just tell me the format and I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think, um, it, you know, a part of that might be, you know, there's such a push for, which is fair. It's, it's a difficult balance to find. I, I understand the concept of needing objectivity in a grading system. You know, if we're going to score students, it's, it can't just be, I like you hundred, I don't like you, you know, 50 or whatever. It, there's gotta be some objective, um, you know, standard, but nonetheless, I think t teachers find that difficult um, or they find it difficult to design those systems. Uh, so they end up choosing things like it needs to be written in blue or it needs to be mm -hmm. X thing that are really, in fact, irrelevant to the actual thought of the student. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's that's something that kind of it comes with experience too and a certain level of knowledge if you're a teacher and you're thrown into a position in which you don't really know the material uh it's hard to design sort of creative type things if you don't really know what the students actually or what you want the students to actually learn yeah that's true too um yeah that's definitely true uh, so you know having a familiarity with your own uh your own understanding, your own skill set, and knowing how to deliver that uh, is crucial. Absolutely. Because I'm very interested in just what um, now on the other side of the sort of Korea experience, mm -hmm. you get your experience teaching in the United States, teaching high school, and then you leave again. And uh, how has that been? How does a teacher sort of adapt to these changes? If, if, because I know that there's teachers who are teaching in the United States who certainly are interested in going abroad, who want to go abroad and might be a little tentative about it. Yeah. Um, you know, it depends on the context change, uh, for sure. Um, 
And, you know, a little bit of context uh, that I think is relevant to understanding it from my point of view is that, uh, you know, leaving New York City was in a lot of ways uh, not a decision that I originally wanted to make. Um, so, you know, with uh, extenuating circumstances, um, you know, my wife and I had, you know, wanted to live together and the only way to do that was to live internationally um, at this point in time. So my choices were stay in New York and not live with my wife or live with my wife. And that's a difficult <laughs> choice. So, you know, so it, it was not easy leaving um, a place like New York City where, um, you know, you build genuine relationships with the students, not to say that you don't do that everywhere, um, but in my case I did. Uh, and you know that, that you're needed. And I felt at least personally a sense of obligation and responsibility um, to be there. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so leaving was very difficult. I felt like I was kind of, shirking a major responsibility um, and I still feel as if one day I would like to give back uh, to that community but nonetheless in terms of the transition uh, you know man where do I begin a lot is different almost, <laughs> every, almost everything is different yeah, yeah, but why don't why don't you begin with just the the basics of sort of going abroad? Did you did you sell everything in New York and and oh, Okay. Uh well, <laughs> to my wife's credit, she uh she did all the packing. Uh, oh, really? and, and yeah, and she was able to ship uh almost everything, almost all of our wedding gifts and uh you know, I only brought I think I had one suitcase and uh -huh. the rest were the rest were hers and stuff for our house. We brought, I think, eight suitcases total, um, like big luggage cases um, with everything for our, for our home and, uh, you and know, arrived. So mm -hmm. the, the summer is switched in the Southern Hemisphere. So you skipped out on summer to go back to your passion. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, I... Um, I started July 15th here, so I knew that I was going to lose my summer vacation, but hey, that's all right. Um, and then now I'm here and you guys up there are headed into winter and we're just, we're in springtime right now. So, oh, so don't rub it in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So then you get to this new country, this new nation, mm -hmm. you found somewhere to live and uh, walking into the school, how are, how are, expectations different how is life different than say walking to new york into a new york city school well you know uh it, there's always the questions of like it, uh, schools are unique places and um they're they're even within a play a system like the new york city public school system you know my experience was amazing. Another teacher's might be miserable uh, just because of either the environment or the administration or whatever. So, you know, you're always entering a new school with the question, okay, what's the dynamic here? And, um, mm -hmm. you know, what's my relationship with my colleagues? What's my relationship with my uh, administration? Um, what, uh, is my relationship going to be with the students? And especially coming here, um, you know, the international school model is, is um, different in that, well, in some ways the same, but it, you know, international teachers rotate and you might be in a place, the contracts are typically two years. So you, technically could bail after two years and say, okay, you know, I don't particularly like it here and you know, I'm going to apply somewhere else and I'm going to go somewhere else. And so teachers are on rotation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I felt that at least in terms of my students and my relationship with them, that was important to acknowledge on the first day. You know, I came in here with the perspective of saying, look, I know that I'm the teacher here and traditionally I'm supposed to be the quote authority figure, but 
this is, you've been going to this school, most of you, since you were in kindergarten. This is your school. I'm the new one here. And so, you know, you, let's kind of figure this out. And it really, um, you know, takes a lot of acknowledgement that you're, even though you're the teacher, you're in somebody else's space. It seems to me that that is, uh, that wouldn't be a teacher's first instinct. And that seems contradictory to a lot of the lessons that you're taught as a teacher. Um, you know, like I remember just this horrific lesson in my undergrad where this uh, education professor said, you, you find the problem student and you take him out back. And she used a very violent metaphor. Um, and like, that's how I was sort of taught, you know? Um, yeah. And it's just su such a different perspective. Uh, and how's it working out for you? Yeah, it's really antiquated. Um, yeah. You know, it, 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 has, it has worked. It has worked well. Um, you know, I, I'm confident in my relationship with the students here. Uh, and I also want to add that, you know, I'm a, a middle-aged white dude from upstate New York, you know, small town just south of Syracuse. Moving to the South Bronx and being a teacher there, I also had to come in with that attitude um, and that kind of respect of, look, you know, I know that I'm the foreigner here. I know that I'm not the one to, you know, come in and just have the right to order everybody around, um, you know, because, you know, just being aware of who you are in the context that you're in is, is so crucial to establishing those relationships. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And, and they've talked, you know, a lot of times people talk about finding the teacher voice or just the fact is you just have to be who you are and they can uh, yeah. find authenticity right away, whether uh, you know, whatever authenticity looks like for you. Yeah, I really appreciate that comment, man. Um, you know, you, it's, they see right through you, you know, students are not, they're not dumb, uh, you know, they might not be able to write very well or they might not, you know, have X, Y, Z skill, but, you know, they can tell if you're being genuine or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes we lose that a little bit in the sort of like just the day-to-day -day of teaching or, or the, the teaching instruction because people are so tense and so nervous and, and there are a lot of things that can go wrong, but rarely are those things that go wrong things that are, you know, irreversible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So you, you adapted and you kind of then continued your philosophy, the same that you had in the Bronx uh, of sort of, you know, this is your space more so than my space. And uh, how, how about the language? Are you conducting your classes in English? Yeah. So um, if they here they take, uh, and I'm not a hundred percent sure if this is a, a model shared by other international schools around the world, um, presumably so. Uh, I have one friend who went to an American school in Lima, Peru, and it was a similar model where they take half of their classes in um, like the native language. So here it would be Spanish um, and, uh, or rather, actually I should be careful of that in Paraguay because there are two languages here. There's Guarani, which is the, mm native as in indigenous language and then there's spanish uh which is um you know one of the official languages and so they take languages in, or take classes in spanish i should say and then the other half in english and um so many of these students although uh they grew up speaking spanish uh in the house are fluent a hundred percent fluent by the time they're seniors because they've been exposed to it day in, day out for, you know, 13 years. Yeah, that's, uh, what an extraordinary sort of exposure they have to all these different cultures. Yeah. Um, and as you're going about on the streets, is a surely speaking Spanish is helpful to you. Can you imagine a situation again like Korea or is that too daunting a prospect at this point? Uh, I would be open to it. Um, and I'm, and I'm pretty sure my wife would be too. Um, although, you know, she, uh, 
her first language is Spanish. And, um, you know, so we, for us coming here was sort of like coming to a second home. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it worked best for us. But I think, you know, if it really came down to it, we would be willing to do that. And I love tackling languages, um, you know, no matter where we are or if we were to end up somewhere, you know, day one, my nose is in the book and, you know, pens to paper, studying the grammatical structures of whatever language. So. Absolutely. I think that's a key feature about going abroad. Is there any other tips that you would give for someone going abroad or someone who wants to teach abroad? Um, yeah. Uh, oh, man. I mean, there are, there are so many tips, uh, <laughs> you know, I, uh, how about, how about things that, that get you uh, through the day? Like I'm thinking of in the classroom, do you have enough materials? Do you have enough resources? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I'd certainly be willing to be flexible um, and find creative ways to do what you want. Um, because, you know, when I got here, there were old, you know, torn up class sets of um, – of books that previous teachers had taught presumably because those are just the books that were here. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, I refuse to do that. I don't want to, <laughs> teach, you know, I don't want to teach something just cause that's what's available. I want to teach something cause I want to, and I want to be as cognitively engaged as the students. And that's how you make good. Uh, one of the ways you make a good atmosphere. So I'm using, almost strictly PDF files. Um, awesome. And, uh, you know, yeah. yeah, so just be willing to be flexible and realize that, you know, if you make an or a class set order of books, it might take, you know, 11 months to get to your classroom. Uh, and yeah. Just be patient. And, you know, teaching and being abroad, those are two of the most uh, best, like, sort of survival skill training. Because in both cases, you really have to create uh, so often when, yeah. when the materials just aren't there. That's an excellent yeah. piece of advice. Yeah. Um, you know, I think also a, a good piece of advice would be um, it's really easy to move abroad and and forget that that's where you are, wherever you end up. And, um, you know, the grind feels similar no matter where you are. You get up and you go to work and you, and you do your job and, you know, hopefully you have some fun doing it. And then you come home and you have your routine, your routines in place. Um, but it's a routine nonetheless, but, you know, here you are in Asuncion or in Bangkok or in, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Paris or where, you know, wherever it might be. And just being cognizant um, always of, oh, yeah, this is, you know, this is where I am and, and taking the time to really appreciate your surroundings and not getting caught up in the, um, you know, in the work aspect of it because it's important, but it's also important to have the experience itself. Wow. That's, that's not only good teaching advice, that's, that's good life advice. Wherever you are, Hour of History listeners. Um, wow, so good. All right, um, Ben, we're, we're drawing near to an hour. This always tends to happen very fast on Hour of yeah, History. That, that went quickly, man. Um, but we're getting to this part of suggestion. So each, each episode, we take the time to suggest Anything, it could be a book, it could be a movie, whatever you want that will help the listeners on their journey through life. So, do you want to go first? Oh, boy. Uh, you're doing one too? Yeah, I can go first. All right, you go first. Yeah, so mine is a book by Scottish author James Kelman called A Disaffection. Now, you've heard from Ben and uh, a little bit from me uh, about the better things of teaching and when teaching goes well and being creative. James Kelman in A Disaffection writes about this just Scottish teacher who is just having a midlife crisis, basically. And it's written in the Scots dialect, so it's kind of difficult to approach. It was written in the 1980s, so it's also got that time issue. 
but it's just delightful to kind of see like this existential crisis that this teacher is going through that I think is real to a lot of teachers going through struggles. And I certainly enjoyed it when I was reading it. And uh, yeah, so James Kelman's A Disaffection. That's wow, nice. Thanks for that, man. Uh, I'm going to have to check that out. It's a, it's a, it's a very sad one <laughs> just for warning you. It's kind of depressing, but you get some good insights into the human soul, I guess. Hey, I can, uh, I can handle a little bit of sadness every now and then. <laughs> so what do you have for uh, us? Ben? A suggestion. Um, In, yeah. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> can I, can I make two? That is, it's illegal, but I'll let you pass for today. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, so go, running with the theme of, of books, uh, you know, I mentioned Paulo Freire earlier. So if the listeners haven't heard um, of him or his work, I would suggest uh, checking those out. And in particular, as a teacher, um, his book, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, uh, was, a, you know, a really influential a piece of work uh, in the way that I see the classroom and my role in it. Um, you know, my copy is all torn up and underlined and stained with coffee. And you know, as book <laughs> as books get when you when you really use them yeah, and sure. love them. So yeah, so I'd recommend that. Um, and uh, my second suggestion uh, would be to get to South America at some point. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, you know, because it's it's just a spectacular continent and I know a continent is a big place and you could go to, you know, very different parts of the continent and it would be a different experience. Um, but you know, with, uh, keeping that in mind as a whole, make it, make your way South at some point and have that experience. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Just, yeah, pedagogy of the oppressed. And that's another one where you should if read it once and then read it like couple months oh, or a man. couple years from now and it changes. <laughs> yeah, it, do, it does change or read it once and then, you know, read it again immediately after and, <laughs> and figure out the stuff that you didn't understand quite the first time. And, uh, you know, it's enlightening every time I pick it up. That's fantastic. Well, it's been such a pleasure to have you on Hour of History, Ben. I'm sure people will be inspired by your words, and I'm sure people will be checking in and uh, hoping you can come back on Hour of History again. Oh, I'd love to, man. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Great. So we'll keep uh, our you, the listeners, abreast of what's happening in Ben's life and what awesome projects he's doing in Asuncion. At the moment, though, it's the end of our Hour of History. Thanks for listening to Hour of History, where it's our world anytime, any place. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to check out our recommendations page at ourhistory.com forward slash rex. That's ourhistory.com forward slash R-E-C-S. There you'll find links to the books mentioned during the podcast. And if you choose to purchase one, you'll be supporting the podcast in the process. And if you still haven't gotten your fill of the Hour of History, make sure you head over to the Hour of History blog found at ourofhistory.com forward slash blog with articles being released fairly often on topics relating to those covered in the podcast as well as others. With that, we conclude this episode and hope to have you back for the next one. Take care, and again, thanks for listening to the Hour of History podcast.